So I'm, uh, I'm glad to be back, and um, I thank you for coming back. You know, sometimes that doesn't happen. <laughs> As you go through Lent, sometimes the, the uh, faces that you see get fewer and fewer and fewer. So uh, I'm always grateful when people do uh, come back. I'm uh, grateful to those of you who are in the second half of your life, and I, I admire you for uh, being uh, willing at this, at this stage of the game to uh, still be wrestling with uh, these uh, matters. And, I'm especially uh, I'm glad to see from time to time uh, younger faces because, you know, when you get to be uh, this uh, at this stage of life, uh, having worked on this for decades and decades, you can kind of see how important it is um, uh, to have uh, some hope that, uh, that there will be some hands ready to receive the torch when it comes time to uh, pass it along. So thank you to those of you who are you know, in the second half of your journey, and thank you to those who are uh, uh, in the first half. So, uh, we have been uh, talking about uh, the various parables of uh, Jesus, and um, the, the one that I want to work on uh, with you tonight is, uh, I am sure, uh, if not the most famous, certainly the most uh, well-known of all of Jesus' parables. And, uh, you know, it is the, uh, the one that we called uh, the parable of the, of the prodigal son. But before we do that, I want to uh, kind of uh, stir the pot a little bit and talk a little bit about uh, parables uh, in, in general uh, and a way uh, to sort of think about them as a part of uh, our, your journey and my journey and, and the journey of all the, all the folk who have been a, a part of our community from the beginning. You know, we are. We are, you know, we're a small group now, but we, we stand, as they say, on the shoulders of, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who have come before us and uh, have passed down the story and have poured their life energy into the story so that people like us who they never knew and could never possibly know or even know the grace of the face of the earth, that people like us, you know, would have uh, some tradition, some um, community in which we could do this kind of work and, and have these kind of reflections together. Um, when, you know, at the very beginning, I don't, I'm sure you, you probably know this already, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but um, in the very beginning, if you read the book of uh, Acts, which not many people do read, but uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting piece of work written by the same guy, uh, I'm sure you, you know already, uh, who wrote uh, the Gospel of Luke. But in the... Uh, here we go. Uh, in the uh, in the in the book of Acts, uh, the the Christian community uh, uh, appears to be made up of people who uh, call themselves and think of themselves as followers of the Way. Uh, way with the capital uh, uh, W. They thought of themselves as people who had, uh, in some fashion, made a choice. Um, a choice to follow a particular path in life or to embrace a particular way of living. Uh, uh, a community that had uh, made up its mind that it was going to follow a particular course, not just any course, but a very particular course. And, uh, and, the, and the, 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 the word way, as the descriptor, was their way of talking about it, or in shorthand, talking about their decision that they were going to, uh, that they had made up their minds, that, they're, that they're, they were going to model their life. They were going to uh, model the path that they had chosen to take in their life uh, after the path which, uh, the one that they call the Lord, after the path that Jesus himself had uh, taken in his life. And they modeled their way, so to speak, uh, after his way, and the and the ideal was, uh, and it's a kind of simple way to simple-minded way of thinking about this, but I think it's still true. Their ideal was is that uh, that if they could uh, persevere, if they could in fact uh, manage to um, um, follow the path, the same path that he took as best they could. Uh, obviously, they couldn't follow him in the way that Peter, James, and John could follow follow him because. You know, he was no longer, uh, you know, in this world, and that's in the sense that he was with them. 
But nevertheless, they wanted, to, they wanted to follow and they made up their minds and in the hope that if they followed his path and embraced his way, that uh, in the course of their journey along that path, in the course of their, uh, their time in that, in that way, that they would themselves be transformed, that they would themselves be transfigured, that they would be participating in and encouraging a kind of metamorphosis uh, in their own uh, selves, in their own souls. Uh, I can't think of any reason to explain, uh, you know, why, uh, why else they would have uh, called themselves followers of the way and what their hope was. How, what, what, what other hope could they be uh, embracing except for that, they, that they themselves could be changed and not changed and, and transformed and transfigured in just a random way, but their ideal was that if they could follow closely enough and if they could uh, adhere to the way closely enough, they could be changed more and more into uh, the likeness of the one that they were following. So that, so that, as it were, every step they took along the way, they were, they were less and less the person that they used to be and more and more the person that they hoped to become. And so, uh, you know, it wasn't long before they, uh, they weren't on that path very long before they realized that it's how important it was for anybody who is on, on the path or wanting to be on that way, how important it was for people to spend some time and energy trying to absorb and to hear and to, as the, as the colic says, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest the teachings of the one that they were trying to follow and wanting to follow. And so that, so that a part of being on the way and the instrument, so to speak, of their transformation, the, the means of their transfiguration was their, was their uh, 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 effort and the desire that they had to absorb the teachings. And to, and you know, uh, you know, uh, I, and then when I say absorb, I mean more than man, uh, master in a, in a mental sort of way, but uh, absorb, you know, deep into their, into their hearts, into their souls, the, the teaching of the one that they were wanting to uh, follow. So that, so that uh, when they were, when they were on the way, they were always, you know, trying to look, you know, forward into the future of their own life, but they were also looking backwards and trying to take their, steering their way, so to speak, by, uh, by the teachings that they were trying to absorb. And for our purposes tonight, the reason I go to this long uh, preamble is, is that um, originally most of the teachings of Jesus were embodied in parables. Unlike people like me who just talk, you know, he was, uh, he was uh, um, unbelievably uh, gifted storyteller. In the ancient world, there were two great teachers, at least in my vision of things, and pretty much everybody else would agree. And one was Socrates and the other was Jesus. They had very different methods and they had very different goals. But Jesus' uh, teaching method had an awful lot to do with telling stories. And the beauty of that is, is that a story can be absorbed by a person at any stage, if it's a good story. The, the, the story can be absorbed at any age. Uh, and, um, and nutrients, so to speak, uh, nourishment can be gleaned from the story no matter what stage in life you're in. So for example, you know, when you read the story of the prodigal son, we all learned that story in the fourth grade probably in Sunday school. Um, and we can still learn something from it now if we put our mind to it. Uh, the unfortunate part about it is that sometimes we think that because we understood it on the fourth grade level, then when we're 65, we understand it as well. Uh, the difficulty with that, of course, is you, as I'm sure you know, is, is that it, it's awfully easy to imagine that you have, once you've understood it at a rudimentary level, that you've got the whole secret of it, you can go on to other things that are more important. And, you know, that's, that's why a lot of folks think that, uh, that they have understood Jesus' teaching perfectly well, and, and uh, what's next? So, uh, having said that, uh, uh, today, uh, uh, this evening, I want to uh, read to you uh, the story of the prodigal son. You know, Jesus didn't call it the story of the prodigal son. It's the name that we have given to it. The reason I chose this, though, is because 
uh, as, I'm, as Bob has pointed out, and I'm, I'm uh, trying not to be too heavy-handed about it, but I'm really, really, really interested at this stage of my life uh, on this business about hard-heartedness towards our neighbor. And uh, I'm beginning, uh, coming at this stage of my life to think that uh, there, is no, there is no issue, at least in my vision of things, my vision is not the only vision, it may not even be the right vision, but in, in my vision of things, you know, that if we do not, if we cannot bring ourselves to understand what Jesus is, how important the issue of our relationship with our neighbors, uh, how important that issue is to Jesus, that we really don't understand him. We only just think we understand him. Uh, and so, uh, that the issue of hard-heartedness towards our neighbor then is, is uh, an issue that was very close to his heart, because it was close to his heart, I hope it will be close to our heart. We talked the very first time, you know, we were talking about Lazarus and the rich man, and the issue there was hard-heartedness that grew out of, I guess you might say, uh, out of a kind of uh, cool indifference. You know, it's not as if, it's not as if uh, the rich man, you know, hated Lazarus' guts, that he couldn't stand the sight of him. He just didn't care that much one way or another. Uh, but it still, it was hard-heartedness, and it ended up in, in a really bad place. And then, of course, we talked about the, uh, the, uh, uh, the guy in the ditch, you know, the Good Samaritan and the priest of the Levite going down the road. And, and there, in that, in that parable, the same kind of barrier that, you, that we can see in the earlier story of the rich man and Lazarus appears again. It's invisible to the naked eye, so to speak, but it's still there. And whereas in the, in the parable of, of uh, Lazarus and the rich man, you know, it takes place in the world, life of the world to come with this huge chasm which no one can cross uh, between the rich man and Lazarus. I tried to suggest then that, that, you know, that, is, that chasm, whatever it was, you can think of it as a chasm or as a wall. That chasm is made link by link, brick by brick, cinder block by cinder block by the rich man himself. And so also when the priest and the Levite are walking down the road, uh, and they see the guy in the ditch, that same wall, invisible to the naked eye, appears. And, and the, the guy in the ditch is on one side of it, and the priest and the Levite are on the other side of it. They stay on the other side of it for reasons, probably again, not of hatred or animosity, but because of their religious scruples and their uh, self-absorption and their busyness and whatever. The reason, you know, the cause of it is you know, not all that important. What is important is that it's in place and the guy remains in the ditch as they walk by. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that from Jesus' point of view, they have made a major error, to put it mildly. And if you go back to the other parable, you can see that the error that they made is no minor error. That if you make, if people like us make an error in the way in which we decide to treat our neighbors, we have made a huge error that has ramifications way beyond uh, the, uh, this mortal sphere that we are uh, <coughs> thinking in. We, we may bet otherwise, we may think otherwise, but you know, there's some things that we don't get to negotiate. And it may well be, according to these parables, that, you know, the, that this, again, this business of uh, treating our neighbors and the how we treat them and the hardness of heart is a, is a major issue. Last week, uh, again, as Bob pointed out, we saw that same issue refracted in a different way. This time it's Simon the Pharisee in the house with the woman at the dinner party. And, um, you know, and there again, although there is no mention of it, there, you know, the same wall, the same wall pops up. Again, it's invisible to the naked eye, but it is real and it's there. And, and on the one side of it is this heart, this, uh, uh, manifestly uh, troubled um, uh, woman who is beside herself with, uh, with what must be some very strange gratitude on one side and Simon the Pharisee on the other uh, he acts as if some kind of rope has come into her his dinner party he's disgusted, he's angry he's offended um, and so there you have hardness of heart that is uh, that is a uh, more uh, uh, full of animosity than in either of the other two stories. Uh, but it, 
nevertheless, again, as I tried to say, you know, hardness of heart is, uh, no matter where it comes from, it has the same effect. It separates us from our neighbor. And I tried to leave you with a thought last week, which I think is a really important one, that, that whatever it is that separates us from our neighbor also separates us from the one who sent us into the world in the first place. That is the really important part. That, uh, that we may imagine in our fantasies that, it's, that you know, we can cut ourselves off from our neighbors because they are different from us, because they uh, look differently, they speak differently, they act differently, uh, they are, uh, offend my sense of uh, propriety, all the different reasons that we may cut ourselves off from our neighbors. They come from, they come from a part of the world that we don't want them, uh, 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 we don't want to be mixing with people from that part of the world or that culture or that religion or whatever. That, so we cut ourselves off from them. And then we imagine that, that our connection with God is still intact, which could be a really uh, serious error in judgment, uh, at least from my point of view. Today in this parable, we, uh, we meet uh, a, another person who is uh, cut off, so to speak, and, uh, uh, from his neighbor, and he's cut off by resentments and bitterness and disappointment and anger. Uh, and the result of it is not, is not pretty. Uh, so I'm going to read you the first part. This is a very long story, by the way. And, and again, is we had the great benefit of the fact that you've heard it 400 times. And uh, so, you know, you can fill in the blanks. It's not, it's, not, uh, really hard. it's not really hard to do. This could be called the parable of the prodigal son. It could be called, you know, the parable of the father and his two wretched sons. Uh, it could be uh, called, you know, the tale of two brothers. Uh, Whatever. This is about two brothers, neither one of them like, are any great shakes at all. Uh, so uh, here we go. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong, that will belong to me. Which is really what he's saying is, Dad, you know, I'm sorry you haven't died yet, but since you haven't died yet, and I really do want my inheritance. Will you please give it to me now? Which is, uh, you know, as I'm sure you can see, is a. It would be a. It may the, the sense of this may not uh, ring true to us, but uh, I was reading a commentary on this and said that uh, some guy who was a, you know, in, in my line of work, was spending time in the Middle East, and uh, he. Uh, this was fairly recently, and he just went around asking people. You know, what, what, what does this mean in your culture if, 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 a, if a son came uh, and said this to you in, in this culture? And they all said one thing. It says, they said, it means I wish you were dead, Dad. <laughs> so here he says, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. He lets it pass. You know, boys will be boys. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant country. So it means what that really means is he took whatever property he had, he sold it to the nearest fence, you know, and got, turned, turned the cows, the sheep, the goats, you know, whatever he got, uh, turned it into cash, put it in his pocket, and headed off to a distant country. And there, he squandered his property. The word property appears three times there in about three lines, four lines. Squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. I'm sure you know about pigs and Jews. You know, this is a story that is uh, told uh, by a Jew to uh, Jesus, Jesus being a Jew himself, to a bunch of people who were also uh, Jews, and the very thought of being a, 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 a caretaker for pigs 
is, is about, you can't go any lower than that. Uh, so this, this fellow here is, has, uh, as they say, he's hit the bottom of the barrel. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. His father had just given him the keys to the kingdom, so to speak, and out, now he's out there in the wild world himself and nobody will lift a finger to help him. And he is up against it. But when he came to himself, when he came to himself, it's a wonderful phrase. You know, you wonder when he, what, what kind of person did he meet when he came to himself? Have you ever wondered when you're fixing your hair in the morning and get yourself together and get your disguise on for the, the day, you know, you look in the mirror and you think, what kind of, you know, what kind of person is this I'm looking at? You know, how about, you know, who is this I'm meeting looking back at me, you know, those sleepy eyes? And he came to himself and he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? And here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, this is, he's practiced this line. You've known about, he's been, while he's been out there hungry and feeding the pigs, he's been thinking, how, what am I going to say? I just, you know, I, I told him I wished he was dead. I took all the money. I ran. I blew it all. And now i got to come back because I'm, not because I've had so much a change of heart, but I ain't really hungry. <laughs> Things are not looking very good out here on the pig farm. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son, which is exactly right. He does speak the truth here. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he gets that, you know, he figures it out. You can kind of imagine him, you know, making his way back, uh, back home, practicing his lines, practicing his lines, kind of hoping to get that sincere sound in his voice to, you know, to be persuasive to his dad because his dad could very well say, you know, <laughs> You, know, you once were my son, but, you know, nothing lasts forever. You're not my son anymore. It's possible anyway. So he set off and went to his father. And while he was still far off, this is the greatest line in the whole thing. You kind of, I'm off a I'm, I'm butt about that. I kind of imagine his father, you know, uh, you know, coming out now in the evening, every day sitting on the porch looking down the driveway. You know, rocking on the porch, thinking maybe this will be the day, and this will be the day that he'll show up. And uh, finally, finally, it's a long driveway. You know, he looks down there and he sees some somebody coming up the driveway. He thinks, could it be him? Could it possibly be him? My God, it is him. You know, and he, I can imagine him. You know, I can imagine his robes flying. He's just tearing down the road, uh, going to going to find his uh, going to find his boy. So. While he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with what? Compassion. Compassion. And here, that's a really important word. It's a powerful word. Uh, because, I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. A parable is not an allegory in the sense that every little thing means something else. Uh, but in this sense, in this, in this story, we all know who this father stands for. Uh, in Jesus' vision of things. This is Jesus' vision of the one who sent him into the world in the first place. This is Jesus' vision of God. This is Jesus' vision of the one who made the world, who put the stars in the heavens, put the seas on the earth, and that made you and me, body and soul. And he is filled with compassion against all odds, in spite of this wretched son that he has, uh, that he has uh, had to... Uh, listen to and, and, and what his son has done to him. And nevertheless, the father is filled with compassion and he ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. So the son thinks, oh boy, now's the time. I gotta do my speech. So the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, he's not even listening to the boy. He's not even listening to the speech. He doesn't care about the speech. And uh, he is, what he's thinking about is, God, he's back. He's, I thought he was dead. He's alive. I thought he was gone. He's here. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, not the rags in the corner, but the best one you can find, 
and put it on him and put a ring on his finger. That means, you know, he's restored to his uh, rightful place as a son. That's what the ring means. It's like a signet ring. And put sandals on his feet because he's barefoot. You're not supposed to be walking around barefoot if you're gonna, you know, someone can uh, uh, take care of you and make sure you got clothes on your back. And get the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate again. For he was lost and is found, and he began to celebrate. Now, uh, the reason I uh, think this is so important is because uh, sometimes, sometimes I think that, and for good reason, we are oftentimes confused about the nature of the God that we uh, are bound to by virtue of our participation in this community and whose sign we all have on our forehead. Uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of talk these days about, you know, and it always has been, about, you know, God rewarding the righteous and punishing the wicked. And uh, one of the things that uh, is absolutely distinctive about Jesus and I think indisputable, is that his vision of God was very different than that. Um, and that from Jesus' point of view, the, 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 the very, uh, and this is hard to talk about, it. you have to stretch language, you know, because again, we all know that uh, our human language is, uh, is frail when we're trying to talk about things that are beyond speech. But Jesus' basic principle is that the that his father, as he, Abba, his father's deepest nature, compassion was not, compassion was for Jesus' father, was not one emotion or characteristic amongst others. It did not, compassion in God, from Jesus' point of view, does not exist side by side with anger or uh, uh, inclination to retribution. It is the nature of God. Compassion is the nature of God. There is nothing else there. And that is, uh, you know, that is, that was really offensive. We may not think it's offensive, but it was very offensive uh, to Jesus' contemporaries. Uh, because it included, it included, if we may put it this way, it included uh, Lazarus. The compassion encompassed Lazarus, who was a virtual prototype of a nobody. It included the man in the ditch, and not only the man in the ditch, but the man who helped in the Samaritan. The compassion encompassed them, and it encompassed this uh, uh, troubled woman uh, who was so uh, uh, offensive to Simon the Pharisee. And here it encompasses this ne'er-do-well kid who very well may have come to the banquet, enjoyed the fatted calf, gone right upstairs. My dad used to always say, you know, you know what happened? He went upstairs after the feast, climbed out the window, and went again. So here, here uh, we have this uh, picture of, of this father as uh, one who is, uh, one who is, um, by, its, by his deepest nature, uh, filled with compassion for the likes of uh, the likes of uh, us. So uh, here, to go back to where we started, you know, when the when the earliest Christians were trying to uh, learn what it was to walk the way that Jesus had walked before them, one of the things that they were trying to learn the hard way was, was what life was like if you gave up dividing the world between the worthy and the unworthy, the good and the bad, the lovable and the unlovable. Can you imagine what life would be like? Can you imagine what your life would be like? I can't imagine, I don't know what my life would be like. If uh, by some miraculous feat, you know, we, we would no longer be reflexively dividing the good from the bad, the worthy from the unworthy, um, and imagining what a community would look like, what a church would look like, if we actually lived that way, it would be something, wouldn't it? Uh, so in any event, uh, we have this image of God here, 
And then another uh, son appears, and this fellow is in his own way uh, more uh, difficult, I should say, than, uh, than this, uh, than this uh, ne'er-do-well son. This son, uh, the elder son, uh, reminds, reminds me at least of Simon the Pharisee. And in fact, I have a private theory that, uh, that, this, uh, that this parable uh, might, could easily have been fitted into Luke's gospel right after the story of, uh, that we worked on last time. And Jesus might say, Simon, I've got another story I want to tell you. I want to tell you about this boy who uh, was uh, this elder son who was so distressed about uh, the way his father dealt with his, with his ne'er-do-well brother. Now this elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. I mean, usually that means something really good is happening, doesn't it? Music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked, what was going on in there? He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because, because he has got him back, safe and sound. And we all know what the boy's, the brother's reaction was. And this is the way it goes. Then he became angry and refused to go in. So here you see, I hope that you see, that wall that pop. It's right, there it is again. It's, a, it's the same wall. It's just going by a different name. It's no longer, it's just like all the rest of them. It's not visible, but it's impassable. And here, you know, uh, this time the wall pops up because of anger and resentment. Uh, and so the, we, when we hear this story, you know, one of my hopes is, is that, uh, that, that we may become more uh, aware of uh, the power of resentments in our own lives. Uh, I don't know a single soul on the face of this earth who does not carry around a cup of resentments. You kind of keep it in your pocket, you know, and when uh, every once in a while you just take a little sip. <laughs> it's like a little flask, you know. You can't, it's hard to live without your resentments. And I got, a, I got quite a load of it myself, and uh, I doubt that I'm alone in that. But the point is here is, is that what we want to be thinking about is the resentments that we carry around and, uh, and uh, uh, kind of uh, dip on every once in a while are uh, dangerous. And they are, they are not uh, so much dangerous to our bodies, uh, but there are, there are things that are uh, dangerous to our souls that, that in the modern world, you know, we scarcely think about, or we scarcely think about them as being dangerous to our souls. Uh, but whether we, you know, what we think or don't think in that relation doesn't really change the way things are. And uh, at least from Jesus' point of view, in whose uh, way we are trying to follow, in his point of view, uh, there is quite such a thing as something that is dangerous to a soul. In fact, you might imagine that he, went, he accepted the dinner invitation to Simon's house because he cared something about what happened, was going to happen to Simon, the Pharisee. Uh, that uh, maybe he went to this house of Simon the Pharisee for the same reason he went to Zacchaeus' house. Because uh, he knew Zacchaeus was in trouble. And Zacchaeus knew he was in trouble. Simon the Pharisee is in the same kind of trouble. He just doesn't know it. So Jesus is coming to try if he could, in that case, uh, kind of wake him, uh, wake him up, make him a woke man. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed a fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. The father came out and began to plead with him. He won't, he, the father says, take the wall down for God's sake. You know, time is short. Life is short. Take the wall down and, uh, between you and your brother, and between you and me for that matter. And, uh, but he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you. And I want to say, really? <laughs> Could that possibly be? Probably not. 
and I have never disobeyed your command, even less. Can you imagine any son has never disobeyed his uh, father? Yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, you need to get that, this son of yours, not my brother, this son of yours, comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, well, he doesn't know that. You know, he's probably just having a, a fevered imagination here. You devoured your property with prostitutes. You killed a fatted camp for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. And there ends the story. We don't really know what happened. We don't know whether, you know, uh, the older boy changed his mind. Does it sound to you like he would have changed his mind? Probably not. And then I think probably not too, because I think the wall had already gone up. You know, and so, you know, one of the great questions that this raises, at least for me, and I want to uh, leave you with this, is that, <clears throat> you know, that we, uh, we oftentimes, uh, um, you know, wonder about what, you know, God's relationship to people who color out the lines, outside the lines, really is. And, you know, what is the fate of uh, persons that are color outside the lines that are, you know, uh, cold and all the rest. And the, and the idea is, is, you know, God will, you know, the common idea is that, that's, well, that's what God's for. He punishes people who have been bad. But suppose it's not that way at all. Suppose it is, that that's just our idea. And that Jesus has an idea that's better than ours, and that sees a lot further than ours, that, you know, that he's smarter than we are, especially when it comes to what the nature of God is. So, so you know, maybe it is, you know, that, uh, that uh, something harsh happens to people who have allowed their hearts to grow cold, but maybe what happens is that the, when, you, when, you build, when we build a wall, between us and our neighbor, for whatever reason, we may have a fantasy that we are only shielding ourselves from them, cutting them off from us, but we might as well be cutting ourselves off from the one who sent us into the world in the first place. Suppose even the love of God cannot penetrate a heart that has been willfully hardened. That's a, I think that's a scary thought. And then suppose it is, you know, that, that, uh, that if we do that, you know, the Lord says, as you wish, as you wish, and just waits. And then, uh, of course, you know, it may come to pass, it may come to pass that, uh, you know, like the boy out there in the wilderness, you know, with feeding the pigs, you know, maybe, maybe it is that, you know, people finally come to their senses and say, you know, I've had enough of this. Life behind this wall is not what I thought it's going to be. It's not what it, you know, been, you know, cracked up to be and make a little chink in the wall. You know, and then the light comes through, little chink in the wall, and you think, God, that feels good. You know, and you think, maybe that feels better than being in here stewing in my own resentments and my own bitterness and my own racked offness. And, uh, you know, so maybe, you know, the, Take another brick out of the wall, and some more light comes through, uh, and uh, eventually people find their way back home. But you know, it wasn't as if they were they were sent into this cold, dark place by the wrath of God. They just went there of their own free will and volition, just like this guy, this this guy. So anyway, that's my thought for tonight. And uh, uh, next time, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm thinking, um, it seems to me that religious life has always been about insiders and outsiders. Yeah. And um, what do you think? Well, my figure is, is that there aren't any outsiders from God's point of view, and that we are the ones that make insiders and outsiders, and that we do it for our own comfort, 
and we do it for our own sense of security and because we are tribal. And we like to build walls, big walls, really tall ones. And, uh, and if we don't have a wall, we don't feel very comfortable. So um, I think it's a, one of our failures as, as human beings. We have a lot of room to grow. But, uh, you know, like Bob and I were talking about the, uh, the happening down at St. Paul's the other night where, uh, you know, the, there was a, what's it called? The name of History and Reconciliation Initiative. History and Reconciliation Initiative, which is an outward and visible uh, manifestation of what can happen when people within the Christian community uh, decide that, uh, you know, they're going to try to repair and take some of these walls down and see what life looks like without walls. Um, so, I don't know whether, uh, does that answer your question? I don't know. I just, just I, you know, I'm not telling you what the way, the way things really are. I'm just telling you what I think about how things are. And, you know, it's up to, you know, you, you, everybody's talking to you about lots of different things. And so, just kind of uh, think about it anyway. And, but particularly think about it in relation to your own life. You know, think about, think about the little cup of resentment that you carry around, that I carry around, and whether, whether it's doing you any good or not. Is it really helping? Or is it really hurting? So next time we're going to talk about, uh, next time is a really big uh, kind of a grandiose parable that probably does not go back to Jesus uh, itself, but it makes another important point that I want to try to make. Uh, it's the one about the judgment of the nations. It's in Matthew. It's the one about, you know, when did, you, when did I see you hungry? When did I see you in jail and all that? And all of that. We'll talk about that next time. And what I want to try to uh, suggest to you next time is, is that, you know, when we, uh, sometimes the walls that we uh, construct between ourselves and our neighbors obscure, uh, obscure our vision of God. And the point that I want to try to make is, is that for people like us who are mortal creatures, you know, God is not up there as far as we're concerned. That you're never going to come closer to God than you are to the person that's sitting in the chair beside you. It's that close. And so that, you know, if you're looking for God in this mortal world, you, you don't look up at the skies, you, you know, the, the place you find God is in the people that have brought you along, got you to this point in your life. And, you know, so that's, that's why we're here, why you're here, I'm here, that we have been carried along by the love of God, mediated, passed through, uh, present, and all these people that have gotten us this far. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate you coming.